<laughs> uh, so yeah, welcome. Um, people here may know me um, from the Twitters, uh, so you can find me up on there. I ramble a lot. I have my blog where you can find like extra uh, reading information and details about all of the things that I'm going to talk about today. But I want to talk about uh, something that I've been working on quite a lot over the last two or three years. And I honestly, and you can tell me whether you agree at the end, think that this could be one of, if not the largest, kind of monitoring and telemetry platforms in the world. And what we're going to be looking through throughout this talk is how we can actually leverage the browser. So like the browser on every device of every visitor coming to our website to look at information about our site, errors, security problems. So some of these errors that we're going to look at are security related, some of them are not, and how we can actually gather all of this feedback and all of this telemetry with no code to deploy, no agent to deploy on the endpoint. Everything that I'm going to talk about is native browser functionality. So everything that I'm going to touch on today is all built into every you know, mainstream browser that's been updated in like the last year or two at least. So bear that in mind. But as soon as I start talking about like these cool new browser features, we always have to have kind of the, the browser support discussion because everyone's like, oh great, so you know, maybe this thing's only on like one browser or this other browser. And I mean the good news first of all to start off is that it's actually pretty good. Like the support for everything that I'm about to talk about is really awesome. It's quite widespread. Like I said, yes, you have to have depended on the client to have done an update in like the last 12 to 24 months. Arguably, if they've not done an update in that long, they've got other issues anyway. But the, the point is that it's widespread support. And, and the kind of the more important thing is it doesn't really matter. So if a client doesn't support one of the things that we're about to talk about, it just means you don't get feedback from that client about an error. And it's like, right, okay, well, they've had an error and we just don't know about it, which is exactly where we are now. If the client does support all of these monitoring and telemetry services, then we will get the feedback. So actually, we don't really need to worry too much about the problem of support. As widespread as it is, it's going to continue to get better. And you'll see why that's relevant as we go through. So I'm sure many people here like me have a website. So I have a website. I write blogs. You might have a corporate website. You might have like a really important website. Let's say you're an e-commerce platform. Your, your website is literally the thing that you sell and generate your revenue through. I want my website to be online. I want it to be available. I want it to be secure. As much as it's just a blog and I write stuff on there, I, I still don't want bad things to happen on it. And I want to know if things go wrong. I want to know if my website is not working as expected, not performing as expected. And I really want to know if there's actually some kind of security issue that I need to be concerned about. So bearing that in mind, we have like a fairly typical browsing scenario, right? Like we have people come to our website, they send us a request on the server side, you know, we generate the page, the response, whatever it might be. And on our server side, we have probably, I mean, people maybe be even familiar with some of the things up here. I actually used to use, what do we have? We used to have New Relic. Uh, currently, I use Paper Trail. We have lots of things to monitor for stuff going wrong already. So this is a an area where we can already agree there's a lot of interest, right? Like just, you know, a quick show of hands, like who recognizes or uses an alternative to one of these things up here? Right? It's like half the room ballpark. So, you know, we're already familiar with this concept that we want to track performance, we want to track errors, we want to log exceptions, we want to see when things go wrong. And likewise, when we build the response and actually send it back, there's a whole heap of stuff we can do on the client side already. Now, yes, we have to deploy some kind of Thing, some kind of agent, some kind of library. But again, like I've had some interactions with Track.js, Sentry. There's lots of client side issues that can go wrong as well. And we have tools and services to monitor and keep an eye on these. So the, the whole idea here is, you know, we can acknowledge that as application owners, as site owners, we want to know when stuff goes wrong. Like I want to know that something has gone wrong because I'm going to go fix it. That's the whole point. That's why we have all of this monitoring and telemetry. Now, there's kind of a prerequisite that is required for any of these things to work, and it's that the person actually visits your site. And that sounds kind of silly, like, well, if they don't come to our site, but what if they try to go to your site and they can't get to your site? So there's actually a whole heap of scenarios where someone can try and come to your website, and they actually don't make it there. Like, what if your DNS isn't resolving? What if they've come to a subdomain? I mean, obviously, it does not exist. .scothelm.co.uk doesn't actually exist. You can try and go there now, and it will just obviously throw an NX domain and say, well, like, this subdomain doesn't exist. Maybe I gave someone a bad link, or they mistyped it. Like, I don't know what went wrong, but something went wrong. This is not a good user experience when someone comes to my site. I'm like, OK. Now, if we think about this particular error and other errors like it, like these full page interstitials, we call them, where you get like the big full screen error and literally the site doesn't load. There's a whole heap of reasons this can happen, but they share like a common thread. And it's going back to this diagram here. So if we think about the error message that we just saw in the context 
of this particular diagram and all of our current like monitoring and services that help us keep our website online, well, if the DNS didn't resolve, did a request get sent? I was like, well, no, of course not. Like, If we can't resolve the DNS, then we can't send a HTTP request, so we can just scrub this part out. And if we don't send the HTTP request, can any of our server-side logging tools and utilities log anything? It's like, well, no, because there was no request sent. So there's nothing for the application to see. And if there was no request, there's certainly no response. And if there's no response, none of the stuff on the client side can help us. So this is the situation where you end up. It's like, right, you've got a user, start the browser, and they're looking at some big error message that's like a full screen thing. And it's like, awesome. How would you actually log this? How would you actually monitor this? And this is what we're going to talk about. This is how we're going to do it. Because we're going to be looking at something called the reporting API, which has only been around for about a year right now, but it's already seeing widespread support out in the wider web. And it will let us monitor and track all of the things that we've just talked about, plus a whole heap of other security-focused stuff as well, which are the bits that I'm most interested in. So the reporting API allows you to do this. It allows you to take that kind of standard communication channel between the browser and your application when that channel breaks down and all of our kind of like standard services that we have are, are just not capable of logging anything because there's nothing to log. It introduces this kind of external out of band reporting channel. So you can literally say to the browser, look, like if you try and come to my website and something is wrong, like DNS is bust, my the HTTPS certificate expired, like whatever the issue might be, there's a whole heap of scenarios when the browser can't get to your site. And of course, if it can't get to your site, it can't send you the telemetry. So you need an out of band channel. And this is what the reporting API allows you to introduce. Now, of course, to do this, you have to actually ask the browser to do it. And it's just a case of asking. Like I said before, there's no code or agent to deploy. You know, visitors to your website don't need to have an application installed or an extension or anything like that. This is native browser functionality. So what you do is you ask the browser and you say, hey, look, if you come to my website and there's some kind of problem that's stopping you getting to my website, I would like you to send me the information. And you ask by setting a HTTP response header. So we've got some standard headers up here. You might be familiar with some of these. You've got like the date header, the server header, the content encoding, cache control, like all of the standard stuff that you're probably super familiar with. You just add a new HTTP response header, seen here as the report to header. Now, this is how we instruct the browser that we want to send these reports back to us, this information, these error logs, these crash logs, whatever you want to refer to them as. As you can see, the header takes some JSON content. So just going to blow that up to take a bit of a closer look at it. This is the value of the actual header itself. So a really simple piece of JSON, you just say, right, look, I want to subscribe for this information. I want you to send it to me. You have a group of reporting endpoints. These are the locations that it's going to send the data to. The group needs a name. I've just called it default here. You can call it whatever you wish. The next value is kind of the really important one. Because if you think about it, the client needs to remember this preference because it could be the next connection that fails. So there has to be some kind of memory effect in the client itself, in the browser. Because if I go to my website today and it works, when I go back to my website tomorrow and it breaks, the browser needs to remember that it's supposed to do something. And this is what the max age setting is. It's the number of seconds that the browser must cache and apply this policy for locally. So it's like, right, I've seen this header. Scott's turned on these settings. And I'm going to remember and send these reports for the next one year, ballpark in seconds, that is. So I know that for the next year, if this browser ever comes back to my site and there's a problem, it will tell me about it. Fairly self-explanatory, endpoints, just an array of URLs. Where do you actually want to send the reports to? These are just really simple HTTP post requests with a JSON payload. We'll go take a look at one of them in a minute. So it doesn't need to be anything particularly fancy on the receiving end, just something that can ingest and process JSON. Include subdomains again, does what it says on the tin. I apply this policy on like scotthelm.co.uk. Do we want to also have all the error reports for all of my subdomains? Yes, I do. Set it to true. If you just want it on the domain that set the policy, you would set this to false. So this is, this is the basic of setting up the reporting API. This is giving the browser the piece of information on where to send all of these error reports when these things happen. The next thing that you need to do is then tell it like what kind of things do you want to know about? Because this is just where to send the stuff. Now you need to say like what stuff do you want? And the most powerful one, and the one that I've been spending a lot of time working on recently, is something called network error logging. Now, Nell, as we just kind of abbreviate this to, is Nell is super powerful and super underutilized as well, actually. Looking at all of my data of all of the sites out on the web, there's really not many people leveraging this. 
the the null reports are broken down into several different several different phases as we call them like which part of the connection to my site failed so we have obviously like first of all dns basically basically punch in like scotthelm.co.uk the first thing that you've got to do is a dns lookup and it's like right okay did it work has the address changed did we get an nx domain like we just saw a couple of slides ago maybe you know you've got a failed DNS lookup because your DNS provider is bad or, you know, whoever the user's DNS provider is. But if something goes wrong at the DNS stage of making a connection to the site, then you can get error reports about this. This is also, by the way, not an exhaustive list. I've just cherry picked like what I think are some of the cool ones. But OK, let's say we make it through DNS. What's the next step of the connection? Got to go through TCP. Turns out a whole heap of stuff can fail there as well, right? The TCP connection might time out. The server might close or reset it, refuse it could be an invalid IP that you're resolving, so there can't be a TCP connection. Again, like if any of these things happen, the client isn't going to make that connection to your site. And I would like to know about all of these. But then, and this is like for anyone that follows me on Twitter, you'll know that I'm super big on TLS and crypto. We have a whole heap of stuff that can go wrong in the TLS space as well. Now, the really interesting thing for me about this one is that a lot of people are migrating their sites from HTTP to HTTPS at the minute. And it means it's, it's kind of like their first foray into using certificates and TLS configs. And there's a whole ton beyond this list here of stuff that you can get wrong. And my favorite one, kind of like down here somewhere, where is it? Date invalid. My certificate expired. It's like, hey, I bought this thing like two years ago, and the person that bought it and installed it has left the company, and it expired. And it happens all the time. But again, if a client goes to your site and, and like your cert has expired, they'll just get a big red, everyone's seen one of these, right? Like you get the big red error message on the screen and it's like, great, they just sit there and you don't know about it until some time later. So I would love the browser to tell me, hey, if you come to my site and I've got like an expired certificate or an invalid cert or I've screwed something up, tell me. And these are all of the types of things that you can subscribe to. But the saying they make, you know, DNS, TCP, TLS all work, we get up to the application layer, there's still stuff that can go wrong there as well. Arguably, you might have some indication on the server side by the time we get up to the application layer. But again, you know, maybe you're sending bad HTTP responses. There's one down here that I see a lot. I don't know why. HTTP redirect loop. Like for some reason, if I, every now and again when I log into Google, I just sit there for like a few seconds and it's like, oh, I give up, there's too many redirects and I just need to clear my cookies down. So again, there's loads of stuff that can go wrong at the application layer, including down at the bottom, abandoned. If something takes too long or the client just simply gives up and shows the user an error, they'll send you an abandoned message and say, look, I tried to come to your website, but I gave up. And there will be details inside of why the client gave up. So all of these, plus all of the ones that I just don't have time to cover, are some of the things that you can get feedback on. But I want to take a look specifically at the TLS stuff because this is just becoming a really big problem at the minute. If you know, like I said before, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I, I talk about the certificate ecosystem and TLS a lot. And you know, every now and again, we kind of semi-seriously kind of like poke fun at an organization because it's like, hey, look, like their certificate's expired and their whole website is down. Because if your certificate expires, you're literally offline. It's like no one can go to your website anymore. <laughs> and this, I don't know why, but this is becoming more of a problem over time than less of a problem over time. It's kind of like the wrong way around. So the question then is, you know, do you want to know about this stuff? Do you want to know if your DNS isn't working, your TCP connections are all being dropped, your cert's expired, or you've installed the wrong certificate? You know, sometimes we see websites getting them mixed up. You just have to ask the browser. So the browser now knows where to send the reports because we specified that in the report two header a few slides ago. Now you need to say, okay, I would like these network error logs, please, because these are fantastic. So you issue another HTTP response header to say, yep, I would like network error logging to be enabled. I would like you to send the reports to the group name default. So report to the default group because that's the name that I gave it. And again, how long would you like the browser to remember this? Because the browser has to remember it. Because if I go to your website today, I will see the policy. I go to your website tomorrow and you've made some mistake, that's when it needs to know this information. So there has to be that caching and memory effect for the client to be able to apply and do this on an ongoing basis. And that's it. So that first header, report to, that's where they go. The NEL header so far, we've subscribed to network error logs from the browser. And then it will just simply send you them. And they just look like this, as I said. It's a pretty simple JSON payload sent as a HTTP post request. And that's it. As soon as you hit the error, the browser will send this report. Now, the age is how long has the browser cached it before sending it? Because maybe the browser 
isn't online right now. Maybe there's some kind of network condition that's preventing it. So the browser might hold on to this report for a small period of time and send it later. So the age indicates, you know, if you get a report in, it'll be like, oh, actually, this happened like four minutes ago, not right now. So the age is quite important. They're also good because it means the browser will cache up these reports and send them to you when it's online. So you won't miss anything. Then we've got the type. So we're going to see a few different types as we go through. Right now, we're talking about network error logs. So you see network error as the report type. The URL, where was the user trying to go when this particular error happened? And then the body of the report itself. Now, the sampling fraction was something that we learned the hard way. And previous features, like the ones that we're talking about, there was no ability to downsample. So if you are a website that gets like 50 million visits a day, and you have an error, like every single one of your users is going to be telling you about the error. And you're like, whoa, OK. You know, we only need like a, a small number of people to tell us that our website is down. So now with the sampling fraction, you can just kill that right down. And if you go look at mine, my sampling fraction is one tenth of a percent because I don't need like this rush of a million people telling me like, hey, your certificate expired. It's like, great. I only need 10 of you to tell me. So like, let's just back that off. So sampling fraction is really good. Uh, things like referrer, um, the server IP protocol, if like this particular error, if you know, if no connection is made, then some of these values will obviously not be populated. It depends on whether or not the actual connection and the request was made. Method, it was a get request. Status code was zero because nothing actually happened. So there can't be a status code because no <laughs> HTTP request was made. And then you can see the elapsed time. It took the client 92 milliseconds from the start of the action to the error. And the type of the error, tls.cert.date invalid. So you can see that this user tried to navigate to my home page but couldn't get there because my certificate was expired. And as soon as they load that page and as soon as they get that error message, just completely transparently, invisibly in the background, the browser will fire that post request. As long as I'm sat listening at the endpoint on the other side, I can know about it as soon as those reports start coming in. But we have had the ability to monitor for things like this before. We have had the ability to monitor for things like certificates expiring. And it has happened to some really big organizations. You know, this isn't just like small people having their first foray into certificates. Like really big organizations sometimes kind of come unstuck because certificates expire. And when they do expire, they generally cause like quite significant outages. So the the kind of the, the normal thing that we depend on up until the introduction of now, we did have a super reliable mechanism for telling us when our site was broken. Anyone hazard a guess? Twitter, whoever said that, you're right. Like the number one reporting mechanism for things like this, like your website is catastrophically broken. Where do you find out first? Well, ask your social teams, right? And go check your Twitter handle because you'll probably have loads of people telling you about it. Now, this is really not the way that I want to find out if something is catastrophically broken on my site. My website is just completely down and unavailable. We really don't want to depend on people on social media, but it's okay because like social media teams already have some like really good answers and helpful things. They were here. It's like, could you please try using a different browser? It's like, uh, oh, the search expired. It's out of date. But like maybe if we open Firefox, we can go back to yesterday and everything will be okay. Like I don't know. So. You know, it's it's not the way that you want to find out about it. And outside of actually asking the client, it's kind of difficult, right? Because you just have to have some kind of external service connecting to you from all over the world, monitoring everything on your behalf. And you know, there's obviously going to be a finite number of monitoring stations and how frequently they can monitor you and all of these kinds of things. It's like with the client, when you're doing it with the browser, it's like the first one that sees the error will send the report. And that means that every single one of your visitors to your site is is some kind of like monitoring telemetry endpoint. You know, they're they're basically checking your site for you as they visit and browse your site. And this is the thing that I love about Nell. We don't have to deploy any infrastructure or sign up to any stuff. You just say like, hey browsers, like if you come back tomorrow and everything's broken, tell me about it. Awesome. So <laughs> Just to show how bad this problem is, um, I'm going to refer to some data from one of my other projects. So I run a separate project called crawler.ninja. And if you've not seen this project, and I'll do this live. I'm going to do a live demo, because these things always work so well when I do them. <laughs> I literally set up my laptop when I got here, and the Wi-Fi had like, de-authed me. And <laughs> it's like, oh boy, I don't know why I'm trying to do this. But I run this project called crawler.ninja. And where are we here? So we're going to go take a look at this. And one of the things, 
Uh, I mean, it's like super simple in principle, right? I take the Alexa top 1 million list. So if you're not familiar with it, it's the list of like the, the, the day's top 1 million websites in the world by traffic and a few other kind of ranks. So I take the 1 million list. I crawl through it and I look at whole heaps of different kind of security configurations on their site. What, what TLS protocols, Cypher suites, have they got security features enabled or disabled? Like what's going on? And then the crawler just dumps out the raw data every day. So if you ever want to come and have a look, you can literally, I mean, it zipped up and everything. It's like just shy of three gig a day of raw data. Um, and I also dump out like these raw kind of text files, which is just some super cursory analysis. If you just want like a quick reference on a particular metric. Now, I'll just zoom in a little bit for everyone there. One of the things that I dump out is a list of all the sites with certificates that are expiring in 24 hours or less. Now, remember, this is from the, the point in time that the crawler observed it. So this is probably somewhere like UK time between yesterday late afternoon and, and kind of like 2 AM this morning, because that's the period where the crawler is like really getting into action. So you can come and find this list here and just be like, hey, all of these websites should have a certificate that will be expiring within maybe even a few hours of now. It's like Poker Discover. God, I did this once, and it wasn't a great website when I landed there. <laughs> it's like, never all f would so fast in my life. Uh, so let's just have a look at their cert. So what we'll see is like, yeah, so they, you can see right there. If I just try, actually, let me just put my Zoom tool on for everyone at the back. Zoom. So if I zoom in here, you can see that they've got a brand new certificate because it's valid from the 28th of August, which was yesterday. So they've literally got like right to the end and been like, oh crap, we've got to get a new one and drop it on. Sometimes you come to these and you open them up and they're literally down and offline. So let's find another one. Blowhorn, we'll skip past that. Uh, <laughs> this is live. This is a real list. I have no control. Like I'm not responsible. Um, O2 Start Trader. That sounds safe enough to open in a live demo. Um, there we go. So let's have a look at their certificate here. So yeah, 1st of August 19, this one was valid from. So one of the other things that I find is if they have like geosensitive infrastructure as well, my crawler looks at things from a single vantage point. So like if it's a super kind of um, diverse organizations, sometimes you'll find if you like VPN through America, you'll see like a different certificate. But, sorry? Startup or study? Study.com, there we go. So there, so this is their Alexa rank on the left hand side. So they're the 955th largest website in the world. And the fact that they let a, a certificate get that close to its expiry is kind of surprising. You would really hope that they would be renewing it. And again, look, same thing. So they literally got down to their last day yesterday and renewed it on the day that it expired. And it's like, why? It's like, oh, you go to your CA and it's like, oh, sorry, we've got a bit of downtime today. You can't get a new certificate. It's like, buy website. You're going offline when that cert drops. So come and have a flick through this list. You will find um, a heap of porn sites because they're really popular apparently. But there are some like genuine other websites in there. Um, and have a look at them because, like, the, I did this in Norway uh, in January. It's like a separate talk, but a similar demo. And we were like, I just basically went through and I was like, oh, hey, let's have a look for like .no sites. And there's none in there today. But we found a .no site and we went to look at it and inspected the cert. And I'm like, oh, wow, their cert expires in like 43 minutes. And I had a one hour talk. And in the closing <laughs> section of my talk, I literally just like alt tab back to the browser, hit F5, and it was like, bam, cert expired, website down. So these things happen. This is. This is a, a big problem because, like I say, people are doing things for the first time. They've just migrated their website. It might be a new process. One of the really common things that I come across is it's like, oh, hey, you know, like Dave installed the certificate two years ago and didn't document the process and also doesn't work here anymore. And no one knows. And it's like this thing somewhere in the background. We have loads of stuff like that in our infrastructure and our applications. And this, um, you know, these lists. Incidentally, have a look at the certs expired one. Similar thing, but they've already expired when the crawler saw them. So you can generally just go get a whole list of websites that are currently offline. It's it happens. It happens frequently. It happens a lot, and it's you can't avoid it. Like, don't get me wrong. Network error logging is not going to stop your cert expiring, and you won't get the warning until your cert has expired. But the point is, it's like if it really gets to that stage, the first browser that sees the error message will send you the alert and say, "Hey, your certs." Dead. It's expired. So, yep. Yeah, you know, like I hold my hand up. Like this will not warn you in advance. Like you should have known in advance from some of the mechanism. This is like the ultimate safety net. It's like if we really get to the point where it's dead, 
then you can reliably be informed. But it's not just about TLS and DNS and all the things that we just talked about. Because what we just talked about was only one of the things that you can ask the browser for information about. That was network error logging. But I'm going to take a look at deprecation reports. These things are going to become super handy for websites. Like I, I will hopefully be at B-Size Manchester next year, and hopefully I can be like, yes, I was right. They are super handy. Because they tell you about things that are going to stop working on your website. And this is what I like about deprecation reports. They're a future kind of warning that, hey, this thing that you use is going to stop working because the browser intends to deprecate the feature. And we had an example of when this would have been perfect, but before deprecation reports existed. So this is the kind of thing that can happen. Everyone's probably familiar with something like this. You go to like a retailer's website, Sainsbury's, Tesco, whatever you want, and you're like, hey, where is your store? I don't know. Go to the map. And you press like the little GPS button up here, and it's like, do you want to give your location to the website? Yes. And then it plots a route to your nearest store. Fairly handy feature. Kind of, you know, get me to the supermarket by the fastest route. Except one day, pretty much like most of these websites in the UK and for the major retailers around the world as well just stopped working. You would come to this page, you would press the little GPS button and nothing would happen. Can anyone tell me why nothing happens now? Because what? So yes, something had, but what? Can we go more specific? So the scheme in the address bar is HTTP. Now previously, several couple of years ago, so many, many months ago, you used to be able to send GPS coordinates of the device over HTTP. But the browser vendors in their kind of onward march of improving security and privacy for their users looked at this and said, well, actually, you know, we're doing all of these things to try and protect people's privacy and information, and we're willing to send their GPS coordinates to like six decimal places, which is like this tile of carpet, over HTTP for everybody to see. Does that sound like a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. We're going to require that sensitive data like GPS coordinates be sent on a secure connection. So the official term was they're deprecating the geolocation API on insecure contexts. Basically, they're going to make GPS stop working on HTTP. Now, they did this. They announced it on their blogs. They do their tweets from their, you know, like the Chrome dev channel and things like this. And then eventually, like the day comes when they release the build of Chrome and very shortly after Firefox and all the other browsers. And then, of course, geolocation stops working on HTTP. Now, hands up if you read the developer blogs for all of the browsers in the world. Right? Like, no. I'm really glad no one put their hand up. And <laughs> let the record reflect, no one put their hand up. So you don't know what the browsers are doing. Like, is there a feature that you depend on that they're going to turn off? what we call a deprecation. So Chrome has like a whole dedicated deprecation section where you can look at all of the things being deprecated in the next version of Chrome. And I guess the idea is you're supposed to go there and read the things and be like, hey, we use this thing. We should change or stop or migrate to some other thing, whatever. But no one does that, right? I, I don't do that. And it's kind of my job, but <laughs> don't tell anyone. So what we have now is deprecation reporting <laughs> built in and sending through the reporting API. Now, if we had deprecation reporting when this happened, which we didn't, we would have got a JSON payload exactly like this. So I filled out the fields according to the specification to see what it would have looked like. So again, age zero, we've covered that. The type is now deprecation. The URL, where did the user try and go? And then the body of the report. So it says here, ID geolocation. So this is a feature that was intended to be used, but would be soon deprecated. Remember, this is sent before the deprecation happens. So anticipated removal, and it would tell you, hey, you're using this thing, and we're going to remove it on this date in the future. You get a nice message that's human readable. Chrome is deprecated, uh, sorry, geolocation is deprecated over HTTP and will be removed in Chrome 50. Now, if you started to get these, you could do something about it. And there's been a load of changes in the browsers. Like the number of deprecation reports that you can receive right now is massive. It depends what features you're using on your site. But the idea is that you subscribe for these reports, and if there is something on your page that will soon break because the browser vendor is going to remove it, then it will send the report. And this could be a performance feature, a security feature, a usability feature, like whatever it is. This was like a privacy security change in the browser. And there's been lots of those recently as well. And you can get this information. You should only get these reports when something's going to break. So this is what I like about them. It's like 99% of the time, the browser shouldn't say a thing. But as soon as they intend to deprecate something you use, you'll suddenly start getting these reports. So like, I, I think this is just going to become really big, especially with all the changes in the browsers kind of in the last 
eight to 12 months, they've really been driving a lot of kind of new technologies forwards and deprecating a lot of old stuff as a result. Like Chrome's deprecating the ability to use FTP schemes in the browser, probably Q1 next year, I think. So if you try and go to like FTP colon slash slash something in the Chrome address bar, it's just going to be like, what's this? I don't know, because they're not using it anymore. They're going to deprecate it. So maybe you don't use FTP, but you know the point is if you did, you would know before it broke. So that's why I like deprecation reports, but there's even more that we can talk about. An intervention will trigger an intervention report. And an intervention is when you ask a browser to do something and the browser decides not to. Now, you might think, OK, the browser comes to my website and I say, like, load this picture, load this script file, load this CSS, do, you know, basically do what the page says. Now, most people kind of are like, OK, I send the browser the page and the browser does what the page says. But actually, no, the browser can choose not to. The browser can intervene and choose to do something differently. And there's three scenarios when the browser can decide to kind of ignore you a little bit. I don't want to use the term ignore you, but it's because of performance. If you want to do something on the page that is very detrimental to performance, the browser will ignore you. If it's because of security, if you want to do something insecure on the page, the browser can choose to intervene and not do it. Or if it impacts the privacy of the user as well, the browser may step in and say, no, I'm not going to do this thing. Because remember, the browser is actually called the user agent. It's there to serve the user, and it will act in the interests and on behalf of the user. So there aren't very many scenarios when you should be triggering intervention reports. But again, here is something that you might see. And I, like, I'm so glad that they introduced this intervention because it was massively annoying. You have like, if you're like me, you've got like 47 tabs open in your browser. And you're like, which bloody one is playing the sound? And you're like going through them all trying to find the tab that's playing the audio because some website reloaded in the background and now it's playing some annoying advert sound that I didn't ask for. So we get a, an intervention here. Again, age zero type is now intervention. You came to my website. The ID is audio no gesture. And it says in the message, a request to play audio was blocked because it was not triggered by user activation such as a click. Now, this is like super annoying for the user, right? You're going to bug the user if you start auto playing videos and sounds and stuff like this. So you might build your site with one expectation in mind of like what the experience of coming to your site is, but then the browser is doing something different. So you're like, oh, yes, the user comes to our website and we start playing like our theme tune music in the background, whatever. But it's like, no, that's actually not happening because the browsers are doing something else. So again, you know, if you've got like good examples now, trying to submit things like password or credit card fields over HTTP, we can all agree that that's terrible for security. The browser might intervene and say, no, you're not allowed to submit a form that contains a password field on HTTP because it's obviously not secure. So if any of these things either do happen presently or start to happen, you know, because some stance changes in the future, again, you'll start to get this feedback from the browser with intervention reports. Anytime the browser steps in and does something other than what you expected. Sounds like a pretty reliable feature. Now, the last kind of major one that we're going to look at and talk about is crash reports. So these, uh, this is currently only supported in Chrome. And there's currently only one that I've actually seen. <laughs> and and like, this is like the only browser in the world that was going to send this error message was Chrome. And here's the JSON. And the reason that you want right down at the bottom, everyone can understand why Chrome is the only browser that sends these. Because Chrome is the only browser that eats all 64 gig of RAM on my desktop. So right now, there is only this particular error message sent by Chrome. And it's if your application somehow manages to consume whatever RAM may be left on the client after launching Chrome anyway. And you also get a crash ID, which you can map back to, map back to a crash report with the vendor as well. So you can kind of correlate some additional information in there which will be really cool. But the idea is crash reports are going to be extended out into other features, other areas. Everything that we're talking about here is still pretty new. You know, some of these things have been around for a year, next month, actually. But that, like in internet age, that's brand new. That's literally like a, a cutting edge feature. So you, know, you have to rely on having a modern client. They have to have been updated recently. But I guess the point really is, you know, even if only, let's say, like 1% of your visitors have an up-to-date enough browser to support this. If 1% of your visitors are sending you any of these reports, is it enough for you to identify and fix the problem? And this is why I think like the, the support discussion is really actually not that important at all. Because I use this day to day on my production sites. I know that there is enough of a sliver of people out there that support this that I can get useful feedback. And I, oh, my monitor over here went off. I don't know what I did. 
So as I said, like I, I really don't think for that reason the support discussion is, is such a big deal. But there's even more stuff that the browsers can do. This is only the stuff that I've had time to go into. There's even more things. If you follow me on Twitter, again, you'll know that I'm a huge fan of content security policy. Padge is smiling. It's like bloody CSP. Um, content security policy is a hugely powerful mechanism. And it allows you to define a whitelist of the content that you expect to be on your website. So if you come to my website, you can see this if you look at the headers. And it literally says, I load JavaScript from these two CDNs. I load images from this one CDN. I load my fonts from this CDN, so on and so forth. And what that means is, if you come to my website and there's some new script tag stuck at the bottom of the page, and it's like magecart.com forward slash keylogger.js, the browser's going to look at that and be like, well, Scott doesn't load JavaScript from magecart.com. He only loads it from these two CDNs that he specified. So I'm just going to take that script tag, and I'm going to toss it away. So most people, when they look at deploying content security policy, are going for cross-site scripting protection. Because if you can take full control of all of the JavaScript on your site, then the idea is that you can't have any bad JavaScript on your site. So CSP is super powerful. And again, it hooks into the reporting API. If someone gets a script tag onto my page, and the browser picks it up and tosses it away, it will at the same time send a report and say, hey, Scott, we came to this page. You told us you only have JavaScript from these two domains, and this is the script tag that we threw away. And I can be like, wow, hey, you know, like, what is this rando script tag on my home page that shouldn't be there? So that is a super powerful one. This is the number one use of the reporting API. So I run a service that collects the JSON for people. And this is literally by far like the number one thing that people are collecting reports about. So it's, it's hard to deploy. Like I give you fair warning up front, CSP is not the easiest thing in the world to get working. Um, but once you get it working, you have a huge level of kind of control and protection there. HPKP, talk about hard things to deploy. Anyone familiar with HPKP now? No, so this this is being deprecated in Chrome already and probably before the end of the year in Firefox. So actually, very soon, I'm just going to delete this orange box and have a space because it's just such a powerful mechanism and it's so complicated to deploy that people deployed it and got it wrong and actually broke their website. So HPKP allows you to say, look, these are the encryption keys on my server. You take the hash of the public key, which is the one half of the key pair, and then you pin that into the browser by sending it inside the response header. And then every single time the browser comes back to your website, it expects the public key in your certificate to hash to the same value. Now, it sounds really simple in principle, right? That's like a two-sentence explanation of what HPKP is. But it means that you have to be super confident that you can maintain those keys. You have to think about your rotation strategy going forward. So it's like, OK, I'm using this key now, but I'm going to use this key next month. So I need to send you the information about this key now so that if you don't come back until next month, you know what my rotation strategy is. And all kinds of complex things come in. And it turned out that actually more people got HPKP wrong than right. So the browser was like, look, this was a really good idea, but actually, people aren't, I don't know, like, I don't want to say not equipped enough, but like people made too many mistakes, and it caused more harm than good. So this is actually being phased out of Chrome already. And as I said, it might be out of Firefox before the end of the year. Then in the, the top right here, certificate transparency. This is a, a new feature that's come into the, the ecosystem more recently. Anyone familiar with CT? I'm always interested. Oh, it's pretty good. It's like one third of the room. And bear in mind, right, we're at a security-focused conference as well. When I do this in like more general development or technical conferences, there's like three people in a room this size. CT is hugely powerful. If you own a domain, um, scotthelm.com, it exists the chance that I might not know about all of the certificates that have been issued to that site. Let's say I'm going to use Paul as an example because he sat here. Paul is an evil person, and he's gone to a CA, and he's like bribed them and said, I want a certificate for Scott's website. Here's $10,000. You give me the certificate. We'll keep quiet. Scott doesn't know. If Paul doesn't tell me and he's not going to, then he has a certificate for my site, meaning he can impersonate me. He can decrypt traffic to my site. He can do all of these bad things. And I literally have no opportunity to find out. But certificate transparency fixed this. Because you can go to any one of multiple sites out there that do CT monitoring. And we now have a public log of all certificates that have been issued for sites out there. So let's take, I always use search just because it's super simple and easy. So if you're interested, uh, there is the domain up there. And you can literally come here and say, I want to see, uh, what's the B-Sides website? It's like .org.uk, like B-Sides, what is it, mcr. 
www.org.uk, that was it. So I can see a list of certificates here that have been issued for the domain name because they're all required to be logged into these public logs. So when a CA issues a certificate now, they write an entry onto the log, and the log is publicly visible, and we can come and search them. And you can literally do any site that you want. So that's B-Sides. Uh, I can come here and be like, I don't know, you know, bbc.co.uk, let's have a look. Here are all the certificates that contain bbc.co.uk in them. The really cool thing that you can do, if you do like wildcard.bbc.co.uk, that's actually probably quite a big query because they have like a gazillion certificates. So we'll give that a second. You can look for just subdomains. Next time, run a smaller query. <laughs> you can look for like just subdomains of an organization as well. And I already know there's loads of kind of OSINT tools out there that use CT logs to scrape these lists and look like what subdomains does an organization have. Because sometimes, and I love this now. So these, this is basically anything.bbc.co.uk. It's like squirrel, straight away, no idea what's going on. Magpie. Anyone here work at the BBC? <laughs> no, we'll keep digging. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's like Buzz, CMS. I, anytime I see like test or dev or something in a subdomain, like I found countless Jenkins environments just exposed to the internet because they're on like dev.company.com or some, you know, like dev1234. No one will find this. It's like, whoops, it's a new certificate. So you just come through here and just like grab one. I don't know. Just like see what it does. Maybe we'll find so like some account.test.domain. So you can come in here and, and find like really interesting stuff about your. Does anyone want to give me their company domain? Go on, someone be brave. Anyone? <laughs> no? No one, literally everyone's like, nope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this this itself is certificate transparency. And the thing that the browser can tell you here is that. For a certificate to be what we call CT qualified, when a CA issues a certificate, it must go into at least two of these independent logs to make sure that there's at least two known instances of it. So we call that CT qualification. For a certificate to be CT qualified, it has to go into at least two logs. Now, the browser will know if it hasn't. So the browser will come to your website and it'll be like, hey, like there's no proof that this certificate has been logged publicly. It could be like some secret backroom deal, it might have just been a mistake, whatever. But it hasn't been written into these logs, and we don't have any proof of that. So the browser will actually reject it and say, Well, look, I don't know if this is like some dodgy certificate, so I'm just not going to accept it. So again, you can ask the browser and say, Look, if you come to my website and for some reason you're going to reject my certificate because it's not CT qualified. Tell me about it. And the browser will not only tell you about it, it will actually send you a copy of the certificate as well and say, like, hey, we found this certificate and we don't believe it's CT qualified because maybe there's only one log entry or there's none or you know whatever it is. So again, it's a, a scenario when a user can come to your website and hit some kind of security issue that previously you wouldn't have had any real hope of learning about. Down in the bottom left, feature policy, another powerful control feature that you can have. Like browsers nowadays have got so many APIs that expose so much information. We talked about geolocation uh, just a few slides ago, but you can access the camera, you can access the microphone, you can access local media like pictures, videos. There's a whole heap of stuff that you as an application in the browser can request access to on the system. And Unfortunately, like as those things become available, people start to abuse them. So feature policy allows now you to control them. So if, for example, on my website, on my blog, I don't need access to your camera or your geolocation or your microphone or anything like this. So on my website, I use feature policy to disable those features. When your browser comes to my website, I say to your browser, I don't need to access your camera, so under no circumstances, let that be the case. And the idea here is if you start to include third-party content, this is when this becomes a bit dodgy. Let's say you pull in some adverts from a third-party provider. It's just like, you know, take all the random JavaScripts and put it in my page. That JavaScript might decide to do something like access the microphone API. And then it will pop that little box at the top which says, you know, like, this website wants to access your location or access your microphone. Except I'm on your website, and your website is asking to access my microphone. And I'm like, hey, why the hell are you trying to listen to me? So if you want to prevent things like that from happening, especially if you load third-party content, you can set a feature policy to say, look, we don't use the microphone, so just like turn that thing off and don't let anything access it. So a feature policy, again, super powerful feature, and again, you can get feedback from the browser. XSS Auditor. So I'm actually going to have to delete this one soon as well. It's the middle column, actually, I've just noticed, um, because the browsers have been abandoning the XSS Auditor recently. It was like a built-in filter in Chromium 
where it would try and detect a cross-site scripting attack. So if the browser saw a script in like a get parameter, like a query string parameter, and it saw a similar or the same script in the page somewhere, the browser might look at those and think, hey, this could be a reflected cross-site scripting attack. And it would either try and filter the script out of the page, or in some scenarios, depending on the settings, it would just outright refuse to render the page because it's like, I don't know, you know, whether this is whether this is an attack or not. Now, the XSS auditor is currently being deprecated in Chrome. I don't know if it'll actually be gone. It might already be gone. What version of stable Chrome are we on right now? They don't know, like 75, 76. So the auditor might actually already be gone. So it turned out that this is a huge amount of code to maintain. The auditor wasn't perfect, it could be tricked. Um, but when it did work, you could say to it, look, again, if you, if you think there is an attack on my page, so much so that you're taking action and refusing to render the page or you're slicing content out of the page, please tell me. And you can say to the auditor, look, if you do this, send me the payload. The really cool thing about the auditor reports, and bearing in mind, we're still going to have old versions of all browsers around for like ever, so you'll still get these reports, is they actually send you the attack payload. So if someone is trying to pop cross-site scripting on your site and they're triggering the auditor, the auditor will send you the attack payload. So you actually get a copy of it as well, which is kind of nice. I've found some very interesting things in my logs with that in the past. And then last thing, OCSP. Anyone familiar with OCSP? Apart from the people that work at CAEs. <laughs> so the online certificate status protocol is when you get a certificate for your website, you may someday lose it. Someone may steal your key from you. You may be compromised. Harbleed version 2 might come along. And we have this thing called OCSP, which is like the most unreliable mechanism we have. But we had something called OCSP stapling, which was a really good privacy and performance feature. And every website in the world should support this. So if you, if you have a certificate on your website, which hopefully you do because it's 2019, then you should have OCSP stapling enabled because it will improve the performance of your website and it will improve the performance of the visitors coming to your website. If you're not familiar with that, again, I've got a blog post that explains all of the details. But the point is you might have this feature turned on on your website and say, look, we should have this feature turned on, but maybe someone broke the configuration. Maybe there's a problem on your server. Maybe for some reason this feature isn't working as intended. Again, you can say to the browser, look, when you come to my website, I should have this feature turned on. But if I don't, I would like you to send me a report and say, hey, I just came to your website and for some reason you didn't send me an OCSP staple because something is broken, turned off, someone flipped the wrong switch. Like, I don't know why, but the point is it stopped working and the client can get in touch with you and tell you. So those are just kind of like all of the main things. I want to spend, I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm running pretty much on time. I just want to do a couple more demos of a few of the features that I've just talked about, and then I want to open it up to like a QA. and a So we're going to try, <laughs> going to try and do some live demos. So I tested these about eight times today, and they all worked. Now, what we're going to take a look at, let's close all of these ones from earlier. First of all, I want to try and trigger a NEL error. So we looked at NEL before, network error logging, and I said, I gave the example of the does not exist. So does not exist dot Scott Helm dot co dot UK, and we should get a nice DNS error. So if you have a phone, a tablet, a browser, whatever, open up your device now, because we're all gonna do this all together. And I want you to just make, first of all, I want you to make a request to my site. So go to scotthelm.co.uk. This is not just to bump my visit account. There's a genuine reason, because you need to go to my website at least once to pick up those headers that I just talked about. So when you go to my website, you're going to receive the report to header, which says, please send the reports to this location. And you're going to receive the NEL header, which says, I would like to get these error reports. I'll just zoom in, sorry, for people way at the back there. So to scotthelm.co.uk, when you visit that page, that will set those two policies in your browser and say, Scott would like this information. Once you've done that, make up a subdomain, right? Just, just pick anything like, please keep it clean. I'm going to put these reports on the screen. I rephrase, the, keep, <laughs> I rephrase, pick anything. Pick something nice. So you can just do like, you know, lolwat.scotthelm.co.uk and you should get an error message like this. And what your browser will do in the background, assuming you're using at least a recent-ish browser, which we should because we're all security people, then your browser will send that report in the background to me. And what I'm going to do, like once I've done all of these demos, I'm going to go look at them. So hopefully we'll have like a whole collection of non-rude words in subdomains. <laughs> I've just realized how terrible this fun is. <laughs> like, oh crap. So, <laughs> so that's the first one. So this should trigger a whole heap and a bunch of reports from everyone in the room. 
Now, whilst they're all being sent and everyone's kind of messing around with this, I just want to show a couple more bits as well. So one of the things that I want to show is CSP, because I do think that this is actually a really powerful mechanism that I know, based on my own data, is very underutilized. So on this page here, I'm just going to inspect the source of this page. And you can see I've got this script tag here. So that's just the code view on the page. But if I actually come down here, and I'll zoom in for everyone, you can see here in the DOM, it's syntax highlighted. This is an actual script on the page. Also, the page is live. So you can literally go to this page and see that I'm not making this up. So there is a page, and it's got a script tag. And it's loading from evil.com slash keylogger.js. Now, we all as people in this room can look at this and be like, duh, no one wants this to load. But the browser lacks that context. It doesn't know what evil.com means and what keylogger.js means. It's like, I just go to the source attribute and fetch all of the JavaScripts and put them in the page. Now, because I have a, a content security policy on my site, if we take a look down here, you can see that I've actually already got an error in the console on this page. So if I just click over and take a look at that error, you can see that I have this particular error message down here. Refuse to load the script because it violates the following content security policy directive script source. And you can see there, that is the actual list of locations that I expect my page to load script from. So I've got, you know, like Twitter embeds, YouTube, bit of Facebook stuff. I've got a discuss comment system, things like that. But the point is that evil.com is not one of the locations that I expected to load JavaScript from. So the browser has seen the script tag, picked it out of the page, tossed it away, and as we'll see in a minute, sent a report. So it'll have sent me one of those JSON reports that we talked about. And it's not just about fetching stuff. You know, like you can control scripts, styles, images, where do I, what we commonly refer to as the fetch directives, where do I fetch stuff from? But what about where we send stuff? Let's say this is the actual login form for my site. And again, I'll inspect the elements so we can see that there's no funny business going on. Close the console, where are we? So form action, just here. So here is the form on the page, action, evil.com forward slash steal password dot PHP, because hackers write bad code. It's, I'm a PHP developer, I can say that, it's OK. But I think we could all agree that no matter how this form got there, maybe it's a disgruntled employee, or someone's found like a HTML injection, or whatever it might be, we don't want that form to submit, If this is especially if this is my login form. So I'm going to put my username and password in, and I'm going to hit the submit button. And nothing happens. But if we look at the error count in the console, it went up when I hit the button. If you were paying really close attention, and what I can do now, jump back over to the console, take a look down here, refuse to send form data because it violates the following CSP directive, form action, self, and then Twitter, because you can tweet from my site. So again, I'm telling the browser, look, when you come to my website, I only post forms to two locations, and it's me or Twitter. Evil.com is not on the list, so the browser said, nope, I'm not going to do that. Toss that away. Send the report in the background. So there's a couple more things on the CSP demo page. You can go take a look at those yourself. But the last thing that I want to look at, and, and again, like before I get started on this, full transparency, this is my website. And by my website, I mean like this is a service that I run. And I want to be completely open and transparent about this with everyone, because we are a commercial service that does this. So I've been so heavily invested in this space for years now. No one was doing this. And I'm like, if you want to collect these reports, like you have to go build your own thing. Like You have to ingest the JSON and process it and build the graphs and whatever. And I wanted to subscribe to them myself. And there was no service. I like hit Google, couldn't find it in like three minutes, which means it doesn't exist. So I decided to build one. So like full transparency, this is my website. But the point that I want to show you is just like how easy it can be to do this. You could just whiz up an elk sack in like AWS and shove all of the JSON in there if you want to. So these are all of my actual live reports coming into my account. So first of all, I want to see this page. Let me just grab the path. I'm just going to filter out all of the noise. So I can say, right, show me all of the things that are happening on this page. Now, I've just done a very quick search for scotthelm.co.uk and the page that we were just looking at. And you can see that there's these two particular errors that have happened. One of them was a script source element. Actually, I'll just zoom in. How's that for size, everyone? Is that good? enough. So here you can see we had a script source element, and this is the source attribute that was blocked. Here we had a form action, and this is the form action that was blocked. You can see down there are the JSON payloads coming through from the client. So, you know, like if you want to look at the raw JSON for some reason, like you can do, it's all there, but you can go and dig into that data as well and take a look at it. And all of that happened transparently in the background. Like there's no 
JavaScript library on that page. I don't have a browser extension or some agent on my PC. Like all of this is done by just setting those headers because all of the functionality itself is in the browser. And this is what I want to show is how easy it is to leverage this stuff. So if I come down to like my Nell reports, so let's see what network error logging stuff I've got in the last hour is this we're looking at? Yeah, so about the last hour. Um, so host name again, let's just filter out. There's too much noise. So I just want to see the ones from my blog. So here we can see, I mean, I've got, should probably look at these. I've got loads of abandoned ones. Uh, HTTP error. So let's actually just look at, see if we've got any DNS. Actually just go straight to DNS. So, oops. Come on. You still on? Yeah, still on. Give that a second to load. But again, you can ingest these yourselves. Like we do, oh, it loaded. We do have like free accounts, but you can do this stuff yourselves so easily. Uh, I just realized if everyone starts laughing, I'm going to have to alt F4 because there's like a rude, <laughs> a rude name in here somewhere. But uh, actually, because we all did subdomains, let's have a look at subdomains. Oh, huh. that's interesting. Did anyone do it? Someone must have done it. Yeah. Let's have a look. Dun, dun, dun. Moment of truth. Yeah, no, I still have it turned on. Report to Max Age. So we have it like a, we buffer all of our reports on the way in, but I'm pretty sure it's been, has it been 15 minutes since we did it? I'll refresh the page in a minute. But again, the point is, it's just JSON sent in the background. We've got the expect CT ones that we just talked about. Hopefully, there's not any many of these. Yeah, so that's good. A lot of these you don't want reports. Remember, like this is kind of the point, right? You like you only hear about things that go wrong. So you know, if you I came on here the other day and I deployed a change and I'd forgot to add a new piece of CSS that we were loading in from a third party, and we just had like this massive spike. So you can get. Um, you know, you don't even have to like monitor the reports necessarily. You can just look for the trends, right? It's like, hey, we've had a sudden surge in reports today. That in itself can be the trigger of what you need to go look at. So I'm going to keep that. Um, I'm going to keep that page open. I'm going to rerun that Nell query in just a second. But I do only have a few minutes left, and I did want to open this up to some Q and A as well. So I don't want to burn all of my time. Um, so first of all, any, okay, yep. <laughs> go ahead. Yes. So the, the sampling fraction was part of the response header. So the question there was, how do you basically how do you set the sampling fraction? Uh, so the website I'm using here is security headers. It just scans the HTTP response headers of a website. So you can come down here and see these are all my raw response headers. And if I look at my report to header, and I'll zoom in, sorry, size, you can see here is my report to header. I've got like group, max age, endpoints, etc. But I don't set it on my blog because I take 100% of reports, but I do set it on here. So you literally just put the value into the header. And I think we're taking like one, where is it, report to, oh no, we don't set it. We're taking 100% there as well. Wow. But yeah, it would just go in there. But we tweak this around. And if you get a sudden influx of reports, you can just like go jam that in and say, drop 99% of them. When you say response, sorry, just to. So for example, uh, if you use the site scripts on the website, if, if someone was to log inside, if you're not just to download, you should get the response using this as well. So if you have a script tag and like uh, U Block Origin nuked it, yeah. uh, no, you wouldn't get a report for that because nothing actually loaded, therefore, like nothing would be blocked kind right. of thing. So yeah, there is a lot of interaction between CSP and browser extensions. The problem is not browser extensions removing stuff, the problem is browser extensions adding stuff. So if you have a CSP on your site and a browser extension comes along and says, hey, we're going to shove all of these script tags in the page. No, you're going to trigger some CSP errors. The, the interesting thing about Report Your Eye, because we collect for many people, we can kind of see these like sudden spikes when some browser extension goes rogue and hostile, and they start injecting like ads or keyloggers or things into pages. Um, so yeah, usually the problem is extensions adding stuff, not removing stuff. Sorry, Scott. We're going to have to cut Whoa. you off there. Just, we done? Yeah, that's that's an hour. Oh, yeah. um, Scott's going to be hanging around, oh, yeah, right. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> My timer can't time because it says one minute nine seconds. No, it can't. No, um, yeah. Everyone, give it up for for, for the beautiful Scott Helm. <laughs>